Welcome to the Iron Middle, the first episode of. Uh, this is going to be a show about Target Middle, a modern uh, distributed uh, financial database uh, written in Zeek. And to be honest, uh, I have no idea uh, what are we going to uh, do here. Like the overall plan is to like do some live coding, some high end, just like, uh, learn how Target Middle uh, works internally, because Target Middle is. Again, just purely as a coded artifact, as a program, it's highly unusual. This is written in this like weird language, Zeek. It doesn't like its memory. It has like some storage for this matrix simulation, basically stuff that you don't typically see in programs, and which is highly exciting. But to like get to that point of actually being able to plug on target at all, it would be helpful to explain uh, what the hell target all is, and. Uh, that's why I'm going to focus on the first couple of episodes. So let's try to answer the question, what is Tragibital? And for that, let's actually go right into the code. Okay, let's actually add a work to here. Why Tragibital? Okay, hopefully. Hopefully you can see my screen because well, I can see my screen on Twitch, so at least that is working. Uh, so yeah, check it out. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of things here. We'll go into uh, look into the code, but before actually like diving into like specifics and integrity detail. Let's try to form some general idea of like what we are trying to do here. That's it. Try to answer the question why targetable. Okay, so overall, uh, like targetable is a specialized database. So we don't have uh, SQL, we don't have a uh, data definition language. We have like one hard coded scheme for double entry account. And that is because, and well, everything is because a terminal right now exists to track financial transactions. That's kind of like our very narrow domain, very narrow problem, uh, which we want to solve to solve this database. And basically, all the unusual design decisions of Tracking Middle ultimately boil down to this way, one single purpose, tracking financial transactions. Uh, why is it? Well, because there is actually a lot of things you need to do to solve this problem poorly. And the main thing is that to track financial transactions, you need the software to be reliable. Because, well, kind of like money is important and it would be uh, bad if, like, some payments somewhere like, just like, you know, got lost. Like, that's, that's like a very important system of record. It must be reliable. So, let's see how uh, yeah, reliable follows flows from the need to track financial transactions. Let's actually look at like what makes systems reliable. What does it mean? Well, first of all, uh, the system must be correct. And that, again, uh, follows directly from reliability. If something is not correct, if your balances do not add up, then, again, it's not reliable. But correctness is not kind of like the only uh, aspect of reliability. You also uh, need availability. Availability. Which is, again, uh, also kind of like 
an aspect of reliability. Uh, because like a very simple correct system is a system which just like doesn't try. It's very easy to not do mistakes if you don't do anything. So for system to be reliable, we also uh, want to rely on it being there when the system is needed. So that's why it must be available. And it also must be fast. Performance. Which is actually also just an aspect of availability. Because what does it mean that the system is fast? It means two things. First, it can accept higher load. And again, if you cannot process transactions because you are too slow, that means that you are unavailable for some fraction of transactions. And that in turn means that you're not actually reliable. And yeah, kind of like it's a bad, bad way to transfer transactions if you cannot actually, you know, at, at a busy day, at a Christmas uh, sale, you know, do, uh, do some transfers. But the uh, second reason why performance is important for availability uh, uh, is that, uh, actually, let me, let me uh, this, add this an extra point, is like efficiency. So kind of like if the system is efficient, that means you can uh, run the system using fewer resources. And that means that, well, you can then scale the system, uh, use more resources and process more load. But it also means that you can keep the resource usage at minimum for a current load, but then you have less surface area, less things to break if you don't uh, use other things. So kind of like, yeah, you, you see where I'm going here. I'm like trying to map a tree of uh, requirements uh, and kind of like my idea. I'm not sure how interesting is uh, going to be for this like first uh, few episodes of 500 dollars to kind of like trace uh, from like this top level requirement of trading transactions to like actual specific weird properties of our code, like using Zigo, like not doing a uh, relocation or using a certain crowd, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't necessarily want to uh, keep this to a uh, high level and to, uh, to kind of have it. So again, it's, yeah, just apologies. Uh, the first uh, episode might be like too, uh, too shy and too philosophical, but we'll get to code really soon. And today I probably want to cover network and where networking comes into this picture. So uh, let's think more about availability. Uh, what does it mean that some software is available? Well, kind of like why you want to use it, it is there. One thing that follows from this availability is that uh, we must build a distributed system. Oh, let's actually kind of like scale this down. Let's like use many computers because the problem is uh, if you use, uh, oh, and by the way, kind of like you see that I'm trying to kind of like sort of do a mathematical proof here where like everything at the bottom tries to point to like some specific, some specific requirement upwards again. That's just uh, something I want to try to do. Maybe there will be like cycles. It might not be like a tree and whatever. Maybe it's going to be like super, super boring. We'll see. Anyway, uh, what to be available? Uh, the TSC cannot use just one computer because well, something uh, might happen with that computer and uh, then our whole system goes down. So we need, uh, again, at least like, two computers so that if one uh, of them fails, then the other uh, can continue working. And that's like one of like, again, like the core uh, properties of Target. Because again, I personally, before joining Target uh, like I worked primarily on Rust Analyzer compiler. And that's kind of like a very simple, uh, simple program, which is not distributed. And working on non-distributed programs is actually uh, very enjoyable, very easy. It is a much simpler problem space. And a cool thing about this is that with more modern languages uh, like Zig and Rust, which are kind of like efficient as systems programming languages, but also productive as a high level garbage collecting languages, with uh, frankly amazingly fast hardware these days, actually can find your whole thing to just a single machine is great. It works for a lot of use cases. There is like this uh, 
tiny paper called cost, uh, scal scalability by that word, by that word cost. Which, uh, now this is a fun, a fun thing that actually uh, outperforming a single machine using a machine is actually pretty hard. Like computers are parts and uh, coordinating computers is complicated. So if you can just do this uh, in a single box, then yeah, that's great. And that is perfect. Uh, and like the only reason why we like could not just use a single box is this single issue with availability. Because if something goes wrong with one box, you need to be able to continue to offer the service. So we need to use many computers. Uh, and that means that we are actually building a like, distributed system where if uh, something goes wrong, then you don't even know which computer is responsible for this matter uh, mystery. And that is actually like pretty sad. Like, distributed systems are hard, but well, I mean, it seems like there is no really any way around uh, building something distributed uh, if we go uh, for availability. Uh, so yeah, uh, this obviously like needs consensus uh, and all those other uh, scary words, but uh, it's probably for later episodes. Uh, right now, I just want to jump into just one uh, tiny single uh, single bit of like uh, how we actually uh, make those computers talk to each other even before. Uh, we get into how exactly uh, are we going to talk about it. Consensus and what dot not. So computers must talk to each other. And that means that like, we need, need networking. Uh, so uh, what kind of what kind of networking uh, would you like really, uh, really need for this system, which uh, tracks financial transactions? There are kind of like many, uh, many different options here. Like you can like do HTTP, you can like do gRPC. There is like uh, brief. I don't know how it is spelled even, uh, but whatever. Kind of like there is like the, the, the basically make any computers talk to each other. Solve problem. You just like go and uh, use some out of the box solution. But that's not what we do target at all. At target at all, we kind of like use our own networking protocol, our own networking code. And that code is also like totally practical. Basically, uh, what we are doing is just like uh, casting some messages to like bytes. Uh, Chicken uh, checksums, and that's it. Uh, well, I realize that yeah, it's probably going to be a little bit too uh, hard to uh, tie this down into this thing. So let's actually kind of like, uh, go to the problem on the other side and look at the actual code for networking, and then like try to kind of like map it back to this original high-level constraints because kind of like, we actually got. Uh, a little bit uh, of uh, what we do, uh, what we need here is like also things like simplicity, like zero dependencies, like zip and whatnot, and we are still have to uh, map those out, like why those are reasonable choices for tiny middle. Uh, but again, let's let's uh, jump into the middle. So uh, the thing which handles network in uh, technical uh, is this like message bus type and uh, why it is called message bus because it is a bus of messages it handles messages and that's kind of like one of fundamental uh, fundamental manifestations of simplicity actually yeah actually let, let, let actually like go and just so I would say that like, simplicity is like one of like the most important engineering principles. Kind of like everyone, everyone says that like things uh, need to be simple, uh, but like a uh, few actually achieve simplicity because like simplicity, simplicity is very hard. Uh, first of all, because actually discovering simple solutions as opposed to complex solutions is hard. Like you need to think a lot about how to simplify a problem, 
And uh, the second reason is that uh, there's a, like, code tends to get more complex with time. Very rarely, code is simplified with time. So kind of like to get simplicity, you need to exert a lot of effort to, uh, to kind of like achieve simplicity at the first place and then like keep it simple. And for like, I mean, for financial transactions, simplicity is actually, yeah, pretty, I guess it should be yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe somewhere here, but again, uh, that, that place is uh, occupied. Same kind of, like, you, want, you want simplicity here. And like simplicity is kind of like the underlying goal, uh, underlying principle which guides it, which drives many of the requirements we actually want, because it surely helps with correctness. It surely uh, helps with availability because, again, kind of like complex systems have fewer moving parts. They are harder to break down. It's, well, uh, kind of like relation between simplicity and efficiency, it's kind of like um, double edged. Uh, on the one hand, yeah, like simpler code, fewer combines often means faster performance. But sometimes you need to do something smart to like be fast, but sometimes not. So kind of like it's uh, this far, but still, again, kind of like simplicity. Uh, simplicity underpins everything. And in particular, kind of like distributed systems are inherently complex. So if we kind of like take on us this essential complexity of uh, building the system, which is distributed, then uh, we uh, have to seek simplicity elsewhere. And uh, coming back to like this talk about simplicity, our networking is not general networking. It's message bus, uh, which uh, just handles messages. And kind of like there is no like different uh, different layers of networking, different uh, like approaches, like, hey, this part of the code base is networking for this, and that part of the code base is networking for that. They're just like chat messages. Between uh, members of targetable cluster, uh, we uh, shuffle this like just single concrete thing, which is a message. And between uh, targetable and the client, we also just you, you use the same, the same message, because again, that is simple. And that is like one of the reasons why we choose to not use HTTP or gRPC as our protocol, because that would invariably involve more complexity. Because again, here is message. Here is like this, 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 whole, uh, this whole definition of what message is in the just like some like buffer with bytes, some header, which actually is just uh, some prefix of this buffer. Then uh, reference count, uh, and that's it. So kind of like just size of bytes. There's like no headers, uh, like as in HTTP headers, no nothing, just like one simple uh, simple thing. And again, that's like fundamental simplicity. If this were some kind of uh, gRPC thing or some kind of HTTP thing, then immediately you would have to uh, write some kind of like cogeneration, some kind of codex, and basically uh, make this more complicated than it seems to be. It might have saved us some time uh, if you were ready to compromise uh, reliability and extendability of the system. But again, that's kind of like another another like big principle for uh, Tiger Bill is that uh, we like to think long term. Yes, we use code. Uh, allows you to save effort to uh, get up and running faster and like uh, on a sprint for a short time, well, yeah, like use libraries, uh, ship products, uh, be there first. But uh, talking about really, we kind of really, 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 really want to solve this problem. And uh, to do that, we kind of like want to build like really good solution. And that means that we want to have control, uh, we want to avoid uh, needing to compromise, needing to cut corners. So kind of like, again, um, how, okay, there's like, there's, there's 
fun, great uh, turn by, uh, I think it was offer of Love Game Engine, where like, uh, the claim was that if you are building complex, complex software system, uh, you want to build a mountain. Build a mountain. You kind of like, you want to start small, you want to start with foundation, but then you want to like write the code on top of this foundation, uh, such that everything is solid, everything is intertwined, and like uh, your new products build on top of your existing things. And that's kind of like, uh, again, what are we aiming at? Because this allows us to like simplicity, to push the edges for uh, correctness, uh, availability, efficiency, and whatnot. Basically, uh, the only kind of thing, like simplicity, uh, investing in foundation improves all the dimensions, except that getting the product uh, out of the door as soon as possible. We, but again, does, does that mean that you are like moving slower overall? Like once you start, uh, kind of like, uh, once you've made the foundation correctly, you actually can move pretty fast because then you know ins and outs of those code. It's just like the question of like, well, you need to spend some time building those foundations. Uh, okay, uh, sorry again. I promise that the first one is going to be like uh, exceptionally philosophical because uh, it's actually hard to like d describe what we are doing without like uh, referencing those like super super high level concerns like simplicity and like let's like invest in our core or whatever because again and if you like approach this from just uh, your perspective of software engineering like who, who does this like who uh who like writes their own like network uh network parsing code like why 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 they're not using gpc well, that's why we want the system to be fundamentally simple we want the system to be uh fundamentally understandable and uh we want the thing to be reliable. We want all the bugs to belong to us so that we can uh, fix all the bugs ourselves. Okay, so uh, that kind of like together means that uh, just uh, by its slices. So that's like from uh, perspective of like simplicity and uh, long-term thinking, that's kind of like the simplest, uh, the simplest possible thing uh, which could work and uh, which could be uh, reliable. Well, byte slices over TCP. That's actually interesting. Uh, this is something I, I, I'm not quite sure is uh, like completely the right solution for us. So uh, kind of like for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because again. Uh, when we get to it, uh, we will go into uh, be talking about consensus. And again, consensus uh, already assumes that messages could be lost, that messages could be corrupted. So we don't actually need TCP. Uh, we don't need like reliable exactly once uh, message delivery connectors. Uh, what's more, uh, like one feature that TCP has is flow control. When like two points talk to each other, they can measure uh, how fast packets go from one end to another end, and then uh, control uh, the throughput of the network to avoid flooding it or whatever. And for like point to point uh, uncoordinated communication, that's actually great. But again, in the context of Targetable, uh, we are talking about cluster of machines. And in a cluster, you can actually, in theory, do flow control smarter because it's not only A talking to B, but it's A talking to B and A talking to C and A knowing that B also talks to C. So kind of if you could, uh, if you could try something smarter about flow control uh, for a neural cluster, uh, but again, so far, actually TCP because that's uh, kind of like simpler to get started because again, like implementing maybe at some point we will get to uh, implementing uh, our own flow control, but that's something we could add later without changing existing architecture. So again, that's kind of like uh, another thing. You still, like, even if you want to do like everything from scratch, even if you want to do 
everything makes it really simple, but still doesn't mean that you need to do absolutely everything uh, from the start. There, there's going to be a lot more of like water folly models with like a lot of more upfront design, uh, but still like uh, iterative development and like solving problems one by one is like uh, pretty, pretty important. Uh, so okay, maybe you UDP in the future, but maybe not. Okay, so let's uh, let's actually lo look closer at uh, how this happens. So okay, that's message pool, uh, which is uh, okay. message message. It is like message pool, and it needs to exist at all because uh, we actually allocate only a constant uh, constant uh, number of messages because again like that we have only static uh, memory allocation is another uh, like design uh, decision in check all but again that's going to be in some uh, future episode uh, is it? yeah message uh, we show messages which are part of the message bus. And actually, let's uh, let's let's look at our our codec for messages like before we go into like um, connection, disconnection, all this like any TCP thing and like IOing and whatever. Oh, do we have? Okay, we have a uh, rest of parse. And probably this field is updated somewhere around a okay, parse message. And parse message is called from parse messages and parse messages is called. Yeah. Uh, so, again, yeah, let's uh, look at our. And like in the middle of our networking code, how this, actually, this thing actually talks to other things on the network. So, yeah, underneath uh, there is like asynchronous programming, IOUing, uh, whatever. We'll probably cover this later. Right now, I want just to give you like a taste of like how simplicity looks like in a real database. So, in the middle of things, uh, we receive uh, some bytes, uh, some bytes uh, from the network. Actually, uh, where are we calling this? On receive, yeah. So, kind of like we decided we a we want to. Uh, uh, read something from a socket, and we just uh, give uh, this buffer uh, to the operation system, and then we receive this message. And uh, once we received some bytes, we increment the number of bytes we have received so far, and we try to parse uh, a series of messages because again, CP doesn't include uh, framing itself, so uh, we must do our own thing. And let's see how that's, that's done. Well, first of all, uh, if we uh, look back at our message, message, yeah, message, uh, you see that it starts with a header. So the physical layout is actually this amount of bytes, and uh, the first size of header bytes. Of the buffer is actually let me just show you this in the okay. Where is set the header? Yeah. So when we create the message, uh, we just like say that the header of the message is just the first uh, some number of bytes of a buffer. And again, the header is a struct which is uh, like super simple, uh, like just. Zig struct, non, non generic, no nothing, uh, which is like I think 128 bytes right now. We uh, might want to expand it to uh, 256, but okay, uh, 128 right now. Okay. So, anyway, uh, to parse message, uh, we need to receive at least uh, uh, the header uh, bytes. And if we uh, haven't uh, haven't got that well then we just need to try to read some more uh, data from the messages which is how we got into this uh, parse message through on receive 
in the first place. So kind of like that's one asynchronous loop here. Just like trying to read bytes until we uh, get a message. Then uh, once we get a message, we validate and check stuff, and that's kind of like it's, it's going to be uh, it's going to be uh, uh, a pretty fun. So let's actually look at our header because right now we need to understand how it looks. So th that's a header. The, the very first thing there is a checksum. And obviously uh, we want to validate this header. And the trick is that this checksum covers only the header itself. So again, on the network, uh, you have the header which is like text size. And then we have body. It's very sized. But it's also kept from uh, a map like there is like this. Rarities message size max. Uh, yeah, uh, there's like this message size max, which again caps uh, the maximum size of the variable size body. And that is actually another kind of like big uh, design thing which is going to thread through the whole of Tagwidal's code is that everything has a limit. Like there is like no, no way, there's like nothing uh, in Tagwidal which is like genuinely variable in science because, well, we want to allocate all memory upfront and for that we need to precisely know the upper bound and for that we need to precisely know uh, maximum size. So okay, um, okay. Before we get to here, actually, let me go back to a message poll and show that what what we kind of like initialize those messages, which we have only a fixed number of. We allocate exactly this like message size max. So again, there is no like. In typical network code, what you will see is that the networking allocates a new message, then reads data into this message, and probably reallocates it uh, to grow uh, up to like the size in this message, and then handles this message to like some code to process it, which will then read the message, parse it, deallocate it, and then like, piece through piece. So there's like a cycle of like. Uh, allocate, uh, variable number of bytes, uh, read, reallocate, hand over, repeat. For us, it's much simpler. We always allocate six number of messages, we allocate messages exactly like for the maximum size we could occupy, and that's it, we are done. No need to reallocate, no need to grow. Uh, I guess, I wonder if we ever even use growable arrays in the main database. I, th I, think, I, think, I think actually we are not. I think we, like, almost all of our allocations, uh, I think like all our allocations are just like these allocations of like fixed set. Okay. That, uh, which is like the most popular data structure in Rust and like it's the data structure of like, the most popular data structure in C++, we just like, don't use it. We use slices with uh, bounds you known upfront. Again, that's a long story. Let's get back to our headers. So yeah, header, body. Obviously, this is a network. Uh, in the network, things can go wrong. Things can go corrupted. There is like some uh, CSD checksums in network protocols themselves, but they are very weak. They, they cannot be used like there's like 32 bytes. They cannot like guarantee that message is genuinely non-corrupted. So we obviously need some stronger checksum here. And the trick is, the trick is that we have two checksums here. We have checksum 
and we also have checksum binding. So uh, checksum covers only the header. The checksum body covers only the body. Checksum body is part of the header, so the checksum covers uh, checksum body. Uh, and uh, size. Where do we store the size of the message? Size, size. Do we have size here? Yeah, we obviously um, also store the size of the body in uh, the message. And for messages about the body, uh, the size can be just the size of the header. The reason why I'm like, I have to look for uh, the size in the middle of this header is because this is an absurdity struct uh, where we oh, let me take a sip of tea. This is an extension struct uh, where we order fields manually uh, so that everything is aligned and without gaps. And actually, yeah, uh, we'll see why we do this in a moment. But because we uh, want to align everything manually, we need to place fields with large alignments first and fields with small alignments last. Because we use strong checksums, we need full 128 bits here, so checksums go first. And size needs only 32 bits because, again, our messages are limited in size. And that's why we don't need to like, think about, hey, on a 64-bit message might be larger than 4 gigs. No, message cannot be larger than 4 gigs because like message is limited to 1 megabyte. And that's it. Uh, OK, so uh, checksum, checksum body, size. Checksum guards both uh, checksum body uh, and size. And the risk for this design uh, is that, okay, no, it's not message pool. I am looking for a service. Yeah. Uh, the reason here is that you could have only one checksum which covers the whole thing. But then what would happen is you receive some garbage on the network. And this garbage says, hey, the size is like half a megabyte. And then you go and receive the full half a megabyte data. And only later you realize, after checksigning this whole half megabyte, you realize that, hey, this is actually garbage. And I, and I, 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 I didn't want to receive that. But well, you, you've already, you've already uh, uh, spent uh, all those efforts to go to six because yeah, that's kind of like the problem here. To receive variable size message, you need to read the size and then receive that amount of size. But if you don't check some checksum uh, when you uh, read the size, that means that the size might be garbage. And it might cause you to read uh, like way too many data. That's why we receive only enough bytes to fill the header. And then we uh, check the checksum, which is kind of a like true value. We just calculate checksum. Uh, at some point, uh, I should say uh, what we're using for checksum because I'm interested in that again. Ah. Hopefully, this is going to be uh, bi-weekly for the foreseeable future, so there is going to be plenty of space for me to cover this. Anyway, uh, validation. And if this checksum validation passes, well, uh, we have a reason to believe that what we receive is actually a valid header or a valid message, because the chances that uh, the checksum would match randomly are astronomical. And here is actually, well, again, uh, you're also not Byzantine. We generally trust that folks who are communicating with target at all are trusted. And uh, we even trust client. And that is uh, another interesting design discussion, which we'll leave for the next episode. OK, anyway, uh, receive a message. Uh, receive header, but data checksum. Uh, then uh, do some again. Kind of try with like well, saying that we are like non-Byzantine is not entirely correct because we kind of like we like trust. We trust the verify, 
And like if something uh, is odd, then we always like uh, err on the side of caution and like on the side of like stopping and not doing something bad. So again, uh, we uh, receive the message, check some matches. So because we assume that the peer is actually trustworthy, if the checksum is correct, that means that this message should, should be genuine. And if it turns out that at this point, uh, the size is either too small, like smaller than Matilda, smaller than what we've already received, or too large, uh, larger than uh, the size of the body itself, uh, then we kind of like flag these as runners and just like shut down connection to this particular machine, uh, which we're uh, talking to. Uh, then, kind of like there is like some extra checks, but after we've uh, validated the header and validated that the size is correct, we again uh, seriously loop until we received that amount of uh, data as was specified in the size field. And then we uh, go validate the checksum of the body and uh, return a message. And here's kind of like the flow of like receiving a message, which again uh, goes back to the fact that we need to employ many computers because we want the distributed system, because we need to be available, because we want to be reliable, because we want to track uh, financial transactions. And uh, you see here, uh, uh, where was it? Yeah. Uh, this, this is our parsing code. Like, this, is, this is our network parser. We just go and cast raw bytes we received uh, to, well, the header. And after we parse the header, when we go to the body, when we are going to interpret bytes of data, we also are going to just cast the body of message to like whatever. Uh, must be the message actually. Where does it happen? There. Yeah, I guess this is this is uh, where it happened in the state machine. We kind of we receive just like some raw bytes. We just like go and cast it to slice of account. Uh, it doesn't matter what account is right now. Uh, and I think this this is in contrast to how typically I don't know protocol works, where you you want to have some extra parsing, some extra, well, not extra, you want to have parsing. You're like, what you receive physically is not actually the logical message you want. You like need to spend some extra cycles uh, parsing from the physical description, like the actual message you want. So kind of like if you, uh, if in JSON you receive like 92, yes, JSON. How JSON works. Yeah, ID 92. Like physically on the wires, like 92 is like two bytes, and then you like go and parse them into four bytes. And this is like hugely complicated code. It always has vulnerabilities. It always like it's impossible to write parsing code uh, without like making some horrible mistakes. Again, not because kind of like people uh, people are fallible, because kind of even be like we have like one place in tiny middle when we have parsing which is like parse, parse addresses. Yeah, which is like for parsing command line arguments so that we want users on the command line to say something like one, two, three, four, I don't know how, how does like IP address works, but yeah, something like this is IP address and we want to parse and this is a string and we need to render it to IP address so this requests parsing and we made back here because parsing is hard. Even if you are a systems programmer, even if you do for testing and like super super careful about parsing, parsing is like still fundamentally accurate, especially in a memory and save language, basic. But uh, the truth is, if you control the system, you can avoid uh, large chunks of the parsing. You can instead of like solving this problem carefully by using a well-reviewed 
library, you could design your system to not have to face this problem at all. And that uh, ties back to this kind of like very preachy, very hand baby ideas about long term thinking and simplicity. Uh, this is like one manifestation. Network code for Tiger Beetle doesn't have parsed. It is still correct. It is still correct because crucially, again, can I just say it would be wrong to receive random bytes from the internet. And then cast it to something because, well, kind of like if there are pointers there, then someone, uh, okay, sorry, there are birds uh, outside of my window, they distracted me. Uh, where was it? Yeah, uh, generally, uh, when you receive uh, bytes from a network, you don't want to just like, blindly cast them to something because the data there might be like completely invalid. Like, if there are pointers, the pointers might point to like garbage. If there is like something non nullable it might actually turn out to be zero or whatever. So kind of, you don't usually do this. But for Tiger Beetle, again, because we check the checkpoint here, uh, because we check the checksum here, and because we check the checksum of the byte here, we actually know that the bytes we've received are correct. And that justifies our parsing. Again, assuming this is not a Byzantine situation, assuming that someone doesn't deliberately try to craft a message to make terrible crash, but uh, we don't do that. And yeah, I think I've been talking for almost an hour at this point. And this is probably, again, uh, a good place to slowly wind this down and say see you in two weeks so let's like a recap uh what are we uh what are we going to do here what you might expect from a few further episodes we want to understand uh the why of we want to understand why this database uses such unusual and weird and questionable even maybe for someone uh design choices as like rolling uh, our own network and uh, the reason for that is, well, kind of like, the reason for that is that we have a reason. Uh, the reason is that like, the incentives we face, our domain, which we are attacking, requires slightly unusual engineering practices. And that's why I'm going to uh, track for the next couple of weeks, like how uh, this desire to track financial transactions leads to the necessity to write simple code which leads to things like, hey, no memory allocation uh, after startup, which leads to things like Zeek and uh, whatever. And in particular, today we looked at how Targetable talks with other Targetables on the network. And the answer here is that we use TCP, but we don't use HTTP, we don't use gRPC, uh, we don't use any other acronym uh, invented by anyone else. Instead, we do the simplest, stupidest possible thing. Uh, we send just bytes over the network, and instead of parsing them with a custom parsing code, we just cast them to the data structures uh, in our language, in Z, where the data structures, like for example, uh, this here, are written as external structs so that they have well-defined layout to make this uh, custom correct, the only thing, well, the two things we need to have are checksums so that if the uh, data is garbage, it doesn't crash the process. And also the assumption that no one will try to maliciously uh, craft a bad invalid message with uh, a bad checksum. But that is what we assume. Uh, why we assume that? Can we assume that? Well, uh, that's probably what we're going to uh, talk about in the next episode. Okay, let me check if there are any uh, questions in the chat. Well, uh, not much this time, but hopefully, hopefully next time there will be a little bit more questions. Thanks again for listening and see you in uh, two weeks. Okay, how do I shut this down? Again, first time on Twitch.